everybody. Welcome back to the Podcast Digest. This is episode 94, and it is time to do something I've not done in nine weeks, according to my records here. It was back in the first week of April. This is the first week of June, so we're at that couple of month mark at that point when I like to bring back another recommendations show. So on today's show, we're going to go over four great podcasts. It's a four for one episode. And as I've been doing for a very long time with these episodes, I've brought on a guest of honor, a podcast co-host, if you will, a sidekick, somebody to help me go through and navigate the world of podcasts. Podcast to tell you about some great stuff. Now, this particular guest is a long time coming, let's say, something that I hope that all of you uh, will enjoy because I think he is going to be a uh, tremendous voice uh, in the world of podcast recommendations, let's say. Many of you have probably figured it out already from the show title, but my guest this week, uh, that that We've been putting this together secretly behind the scenes for a couple of weeks now. He is a uh, geek blogger, podcast super fan, podcast producer, so much more. Everybody knows this guy, Agent Palmer. Welcome to the Podcast Digest. Well, thanks for having me, Dan. This is a, this is a real treat. It's a treat to have you, man. You are a uh, preeminent uh, podcast presence, as I'm sure just about everyone listening knows. However... For some strange reason, Palmer, if somebody listening to this episode right now has no clue who you are, can you please fill them in? Yes. Uh, well, I started innocently enough with uh, a blog, agentpalmer.com, and then slowly but surely uh, started listening to independent podcasts uh, more and more. Um, as, from, as with many, uh, my gateway was Marin and Nerdist and Smodcast, and then I started getting into the smaller ones and you know, the one thing that really uh, got me engaged was the engagement. Um, you know, I would tweet to these independent podcasts and they would tweet me back and it was exciting and uh, started up, um, you know, relationships and friendships. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And now I am behind the scenes of um, quite a few podcasts and we're going to talk about all that. But before I do that, I want to make sure we give appropriate time and talk about something that I know you don't often talk too much about. Uh, at least I haven't heard too much of a deep dive into it. So I want to know more about the blog, agentpalmer.com. You do a lot of stuff on there of all kinds of variety, some podcast related, uh, much of it not. Can you talk a little bit about kind of why you got that started? What was sort of the motivation? What 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 is all that? The The real... Um, it started really, I, I hadn't written in a long time. I think I had taken what I will call a sabbatical from writing. And it was probably from the end of college through when I started the blog. Um, quick math says probably about eight years I had spent without writing anything. And I was a writer in high school and I was a writer in college. And then it just kind of fell away from me. Um, so I started it as a challenge to myself to get back into it. You know, writing's like riding a bike. The more you do it, you know, you never really forget how to do it, but you're a little rusty when you start off. And I just, I didn't want it to be like a live journal type scenario. I just wanted to tell stories and it was going to be anything that came to mind. But for me, all of that is encompassed under the geek umbrella, whether it be a sports geek or a tech geek or a movie geek or a book geek. So and that's where I came up the tagline with the tagline of all things geek I am. And so really it's just been, um, you know, consistency. Um, I was, if you'll go back to my, through my archive, very inconsistent in the beginning. And then I challenged myself and I, I started getting very consistent, you know, week after week, one post a week. And then, um, about two years ago, I bought a house. And became inconsistent for about two or three months, which I guess would probably happen to almost anyone who buys a house. And so when I finally settled in, I decided to do a year of content. It was a personal challenge to write two blogs a week for an entire year. And I came out of that uh, successfully, um, didn't really hit any walls, and then... I was like, all right, it's time to go back to once a week. And uh, more or less, it's been about 1.75 a week. 
Um, on average, on average, you know, I, I do schedule my stuff out, um, which we can talk about later, but I, I do believe in scheduling. So, um, it's not, you know, set in stone, but I, you know, if I wanted to, I could pull up and tell you what I'm thinking about writing next week and the following week and the following week. But, um, you know, things happen. So, um, you know, for example, this past, um, you know, I, I, on my schedule, I have the movies that are coming out that I might like to write about. So Deadpool was on there, but I just didn't get the time to see Deadpool in a theater. So it wasn't actually scheduled. It was just kind of an extra. But Batman versus Superman, I did. So I threw that in as an extra post on a Monday, as I usually post on Thursdays. And it's really just um, me being able to tell a story. I try, you know, I will, I will grant you, I write some list posts, but I try and be a little humorous with it. Um, I write movie reviews, but I try to give you my spin as if I'm talking to you. Um, so it's not like, oh, it was a good plot, five stars, this, that. And like, I want it to be like I'm talking to you right now. And so my goal is to tell a story. Um, so that's, that's really where it came about. And the motivation is really just to keep writing. And to keep telling those stories, um, it, it, it really doesn't matter if nobody reads it, if one person reads it, if a thousand people read it. Um, you know, unlike podcasts, blogs don't really get that much interaction. Um, but I do hear from people from time to time. But I don't need it. You know, I know it's out there. I know people are reading it. Hopefully they're enjoying it and hopefully they're coming back. Talk to me about the design of the website, Palmer. Super unique setup and uh, one of the most unique uh, places uh, on the web for that. How, how, just real quick, I don't want to get too technical for folks, but what's the story behind it? It's a pretty cool setup. Well, the, the idea was the spy theme. I mean, that was always going to be the, uh, the, the, the theme of the website. And it was, you know, about paperwork and a messy desk and dossiers and, um, you know, I, I have a friend who's a really talented designer who came up with it. And, um, you know, I think I was like, you know, I just want it to be like a dirty spy desk and um, or a, a busy spy desk, not necessarily dirty. Uh, I'm not, you know, not to go too technical, but I understand the idea of too busy. So there was a the definite balance. And what he came back with is almost exactly what you see the the one thing was at the very bottom if you scroll to the bottom of any page on the left hand side is a glass of scotch and on the right is a d a d20 um and the idea was that he was like which one do you want and i was like you know what let's just put them both on let's 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 do it but <laughs> but the other thing was um my original incarnation of a website um i have fortune cookies on the sidebar so that's where the fortune cookie came in as part of the design and the typewriter was because I wanted it to have like an old school feel for me. Like I understand that, you know, bond has adapted to the times and this, that, and the other thing. But you know, the origin of my name, agent Palmer comes from Harry Palmer, which was the film adaptation of the book, the Ipcress file where they were like, you know, in the book, Len Dayton's character is unnamed in the movies, they needed to give him a name and they named him Harry Palmer. So I just went, you know what? I like that. I'll, I'll take agent Palmer. And, but, but that to me, uh, and I, I just can't get it out of my head. Like the spy game is, you know, the, 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 the gun and the gumshoe and, and, and the cigarette and, you know, the typewriter and all of that old, like 60s, 70s stuff that I just can't get out of my head. So that was, that was really where the feel came from. Oh, it's a super cool site, folks. And of course, as always, links are in the show notes uh, for Agent Palmer's uh, blog. And you want to check this out, if for nothing else, uh, to get the visual of what Palmer and I are talking about. And, and you know, you're pretty sure uh, if you're a big podcast listener, you're going to find something in here uh, that Palmer has put out that you will find super interesting. Uh, it's bookmarked for me. I check it periodically. Uh, and part of that reason is uh, a lot more of the active podcast related stuff you're doing so let's jump into your ever expanding role in some of the podcasts you i mentioned a podcast super fan which is where i'm going to be plugging your uh you know your archives for some recommendations here in just a few but you've also taken an active role in several shows let's run those down and what exactly it is that you do for them well we'll, we'll start out with seven days a geek um not too long ago 
I got reviewed uh, as I am the producer of Seven Days a Geek, and they did a performance review uh, asking for listener feedback, and that went about that went over very well. It it actually ended up being more of a roast than a review, but was to be expected. Um, and then, you know, I intern for the Wicked Theory podcast. Bill Sweeney, the host, uh, refuses to give me anything more than an intern title. Um, I also produce. Uh, for the Diamond Dave show, I um, copy edit the uh, text uh, or the first round of text for Chronicles Unwritten. And, um, you know, from there, it's just a matter of I am a regular emailer uh, to such uh, wonderful shows as a um, couple things, podcast, uh, Dark Angels and Pretty Freaks. Uh, I also email Wicked Theory and Bill's new show, um, Preacher vs. Preacher, and as a side note, for all of the Meyer family podcasts, Diamond Minds, The Diamond Dave Show, and Our Liner Notes, I am the official, um, if you have a complaint, please email theagentpalmer at gmail.com. The, the, the complaint department. The complaint department, that is me. The email triager. For anybody who doesn't know, at least in the context of your roles with some of these show, define producer for me. Exactly what does that entail? Well, for Seven Days a Geek um, and for the Diamond Dave show, it's really just a matter of, um, you know, communicating with the hosts, getting a, a show rundown, if you will. So the topics or the guests uh, are scheduled and the topics are informed. There's a rundown. We know you know, reminding the hosts what episode it is as uh, from time to time they forget. Um, I think anyone who's listened to an independent podcast will have, it, it just happens like from time to time, you'll, you'll listen to an episode and be like, wait a minute. I thought last week was 54. Why is this week 54? And you know, it, Listen, or unless you're if you're Neil and Annalise of Dark Angels and Pretty Freaks, you just release them out of order, you know. Well, or you release them in order and change the numbers, you know, <laughs> to fit your. Um, yeah. But I mean, you know, the, there's, uh, you know, part of it is um, I was a friend or I became a friend and I, I, I was willing to help out. And, you know, I, I'm I'm just going to say this, you know, most of these shows that I'm involved with or any show in general can always use some assistance. And I'm not saying that they can't do it on their own, but you know, as you probably know, being a solo podcaster, it's not the easiest thing to take on all by yourself. So any little bit of help you can get, whether it be promotion or maybe somebody pulling some topics for you or doing some scheduling helps out immensely. And, you know, all joking aside, and, and I'm more than willing to play along with the jokes on air you know, we, we, we have very good relationships behind the scenes. These these guys are my friends. Well, I know that uh, I've heard from, from many of those people you mentioned as well that you have contributed, uh, you know, invaluable time and effort. And, and just to be clear, none of the roles you've described, and correct me if I'm wrong, are paid gigs. Th that is correct. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I know David Myers uh, has spoken at length uh, about your uh, valuable contributions to, to several of his efforts. So uh, I know that uh, I imagine uh, the other shows you have a hand in as well would, would probably say, you know, very similar things. It, it appears so. I mean, it, but you know what? I mean, it's, it, they all became friends first, which is what I'll say. I mean, that's, it's not like a dirty little secret, but they all became friends first. And, you know, from there, you know, talking outside of the podcast, it became, you know, Hey, you know, if you need some help, let me know. And, um, you know, most of the time you put that out there to a podcaster listeners beware, they will take you up on it. So <laughs> I was going to say, you just probably put that out to, uh, let's say hundreds of podcasters who listen to this. So, uh, yeah, about that email, Palmer, uh, <laughs> you may have a lot of new friends after, uh, this little conversation here, but you mentioned some of the ways that you help and probably, uh, your most voracious presence, uh, is on Twitter. 
And that is what you and I had discussed in advance. Folks, uh, longtime listeners of the Podcast Digest know that I open these recommendation shows before we jump into the shows with what we like to call a discussion topic, which is just kind of two of us, myself and the co-host, kind of waxing poetic about a uh, particular popular topic in the world of podcasting. And we decided to talk about sort of the interrelationship between podcasting and social media. And I thought that's a perfect topic. For somebody like Agent Palmer, you guys follow Palmer on Twitter, and if you don't link to that in the show notes, you will realize that he is one of the most active, engaged, you referenced it in your story, Palmer, uh, that that's kind of how things started when you reached out to show hosts and they engage back. Um, So let's talk about it. Generally speaking, top line, Palmer, what are your thoughts about the dependency or coexistence, if you will, of podcasts and social media? I I really, truly believe you. it's hard to have... Uh, a podcast without having a social media presence. Um, and it's, it's one of those scenarios where it's all about, um, staying consistent. You don't have to be me. <laughs> you don't have to live tweet every show that you listen to. You don't have to promote it a thousand times and you don't have to follow everybody who follows you, but you need to be consistent. So, if you're a podcast that does interact with your fans, you need to be consistent. And I'm not saying you can't change that. You can't go from one who interacts to, oh, hold on, I got to take a step back. I don't have the time for this. It's just that when when your followers expect consistency, um, right or wrong, that's kind of what we come to, you know, uh, like expect from certain things. So if I see that. Dan is interacting on a regular basis. When I tweet him, I expect a response. But if I see that you aren't, you know, I, I'm still going to follow the account because I want to know about when new shows are going to come out. I just know that every once in a while, maybe we'll hear from you. You know what I mean? So it's not all about, Hey, you have to be attached to your phone. You can't have a life, but you need to be consistent. It's it, the inconsistency is probably the number one thing that bothers people the most about social media, especially from brands. And I think that's the other thing. Podcasts, whether it's just a hobby or not, you're, you know, you're still up there. You're still equal to the Marins and the Hardwicks and the Kevin Smiths of the world, because in in most of your podcatchers in iTunes, you could be right next to them in their playlist. So. You may think eh, this is just a side hobby. It's just a yeah, it's just a thing. But to your listeners who will listen to you before or after they listen to Mark Marin or Kevin Smith, you are equal to them. And it's something that, you know, I, I don't want people to take lightly because it it is a responsibility. I mean, I know there's a jump taking, you know, putting yourself out there, but, you know, you have to understand how people perceive that. And you are in independent podcast or professional podcast. You're a podcast. And when they, when they, you know, when they try and explain to their friends what a podcast is, your podcast could be named right up against all those other big guys. So just remember um, how you're perceived is, is not necessarily how you put yourself out there as like, Hey, this is just a hobby thing. Um, yeah. And, and I think an important part of that is is a balance. It's something that I've focused on a lot in my social media presence. And, and primarily when I say social media presence, I'm referring to Twitter. Yes, I have the occasion. I, I cross post to Facebook, but there's very little interaction there for me. Um, Instagram, I have rebranded under my show title, but I still treat it like my personal Instagram account. And I've done that on purpose because to your point, I think one of the most important things about social media is to get beyond the brand. And what I mean by that is, and this is what I was referring to when I say striking a balance, I talk about on Twitter my show announcements, my release schedule, my back catalog, my, you know, follow here, support there. But I also want to make sure that my personality comes through. Um, So on any given day, I could be treating, uh, tweeting funny articles, uh, videos I've found, um, you know, uh, podcasting relevant news or just personal stuff. And over on my Instagram, I got pictures of my dogs. I got pictures of wedding venues I've DJed at. And, And the reason that is, is because, and I've said this to many people and many other hosts that I believe that People will go to a show because of the content, but they'll stay for it because of the hosts. 
if they like you as people, if they find you, uh, you know, interesting or appealing or like minded or whatever the case may be, that's what's going to keep them coming back. The content just gets them there. It's the hosts that make them stay. And I think you can continue like me. I release weekly. Well, there's six other days of the week, and I tend to try to use social media as kind of continuing that conversation. And you brought up a great point, making sure that two-way conversation. In my whole time since I launched the the show in September 2014, anybody who's ever tweeted at me or commented on a Facebook post that said they liked an episode, I have responded with, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Every single time. And I think that's important. Oh, absolutely. And I, I like the fact that you bring up the personality because you're absolutely right. It's, it is the personality. I mean, there are a, I, I, I don't know for math, but I'm sure there are thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of geek podcasts that are out there. I choose to listen to and help, you know, seven days a geek and the wicked theory podcast because not only did I enjoy the content, but I enjoyed the personalities that are involved in those shows. And that was before I became friends with them. So absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and the other thing is, and this is Grant Markham's favorite saying, the kilted one from seven days a geek is that chemistry um, or, or, you know, host chemistry has a lot to do with success. And it's because you can really like, one host but if the other guy's just an ass i i don't know how much longer you can keep putting up with that because you really like the one guy and you want to defend him and that's not going to happen as just a regular listener so the the personalities need to not only stand on their own to pull people in but when you're talking about multiple hosts on a show the personalities need to work together as well Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you are primarily Twitter, but I'm sure you use the other ones. What do you think of the value of some of the other major social medias? Do you find them less or more or different? What are your thoughts? I I am on all of them. Um, I have a Facebook page, and obviously I have a Facebook profile. I really am not on there that much. I'm not going to say I gave up on Facebook. I still post my... Uh, uh, my my articles and um, maybe some podcasts here and there. And um, just as a little tip before I move on, anyone who's not happy with their Facebook page, say you have maybe less than 200 likes on your page, just make sure you share it through your page onto your profile because odds are you're connected with more friends than people that like your page and it's just going to push it out there. And that's basically what I do. Um, my Facebook posts really don't do well on the page until I share them through my profile. Um, and that was, you know, these things change all the time. Uh, so I'm not saying I've given up on Facebook. I mean, obviously I'm still there, but when Facebook changed the algorithm and it went to a more pay to play scenario, I was like, yeah, I'm still going to put it here. I'm still going to share it with my friends, but I'm I'm not going to put the effort and energy into it as much. Uh, Twitter, I enjoy because, you know, everybody got in, in, in a huge uproar that, you know, oh, they're going to change the algorithm and you're not going to be able to see every tweet. Well, we know that's not the case anymore. That was, you know, a red herring, if you will. But, um, you know, uh, I, I'm on Pinterest and I see the value in that because I'm going to reach a different audience. Uh, one that still may enjoy a, a movie review I did, but that probably isn't on Twitter or doesn't follow me on Twitter. Um, And uh, I'm on Tumblr, and I enjoy Tumblr for what it is. And um, I'm I'm all for, uh, you know, Tumblr as a way to push your content out in another way. Uh, And it's very similar to your Twitter, where people can like your stuff, people can share your stuff, and people can comment on your stuff. And, you know, it's one of those... But, but all of those together, it's the same thing. It's consistency. Do you have time to, you know, I'm talking about a, maybe two posts a week. So do I have time to make sure that when I put up a post, I can tweet about it, put it on Facebook, share it with my friends, put it on Tumblr, put it on Pinterest. I can, but 
you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody can. And right. I consistently, you know, maybe I miss a week, um, but I consistently attempt to make sure I'm feeding all of those social networks consistently. And, and that's what I'll just keep, you know, that's the, the real, it's gotta be consistent. You know, um, if people are following you and they get used to, you put it out once a week and you miss a week and then you miss a week. I'm not necessarily saying everybody's going to jump to the unfollow or whatever the equivalent is on whatever social media, but they may not be looking forward to your stuff anymore. No, I would agree with that. And I think one of the reasons, especially in the podcasting world, Twitter became so relevant. Two reasons. One, there is an idea and sense of community. And I don't know that anybody does two way communication better than Twitter in terms of social media. Uh, and second, that arguably podcast listeners have to have a certain degree of technical expertise still at this point. And I think the same could be said for Twitter as well. So I think the audience uh, overlaps and aligns pretty well. And I think that's why a podcasting world and a Twitter world have a, 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 a uh, copacetic relationship. Well, that and um, one of the things that really got my really, you know, really got me talking with these podcasts was live tweeting shows. And there's not another medium out there other than Twitter where you can get away with that, where I can be like, yeah. oh, that was so cool. Or, um, you know, I'm going to answer this question with what I think um, and tag the people talking about it on the podcast. So, you know, that live interaction with the on demand, um, just like people live tweet television shows, you know, it's instant feedback. And, you know, if you're a podcaster and you don't feed off of that instant feedback, or that instant interaction of somebody's following along, then uh, check yourself because that that stuff it doesn't happen very often um, unless you're one of the huge big boys and you should be you know happy. I mean, obviously, you know I understand it's not all positive, but they're still listening to your show. So whether they disagree with your argument or agree with your argument, you should respond if you can. And if that's what you've established, because, you know, you might lose them. I mean, you could gain them. I mean, not gain them, but you can hook them more by interacting um, than anything you could say on the podcast. Absolutely true, because if they don't feel that interaction, they may go off and try to find something else. And they may listen to any of the four shows we're about to tell them about, Palmer. <laughs> Let's get into our show recommendations. That's why people are really here. They want to hear about new stuff for their playlist, and we've got some good ones. So you want to take the lead, or you want me to set the example? What do you prefer? Uh, I, I will I will boldly uh, suggest that you go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So two shows each, folks. We're going to alternate back and forth. My first show is one that I'm trying to recall exactly where I first heard it, but it was a featured segment on another show. And I'm sorry, I, I just cannot recall too many shows in the playlist at this point. But from there, I hopped over and I have literally gone through the back catalog. At the time of recording, there's only a dozen episodes out there, uh, but it is a completely different concept. I think that's one of the things about my two shows I'm bringing, Palmer, is these are two really unique concepts. And it's one of those kind of like slap your forehead with your palm and be like, oh, why didn't I think of that? And that's what these two <laughs> shows are. This one's called uh, Beautiful Stories from Anonymous People, Shorter, More Complex commonly referred to as Beautiful Anonymous. This is hosted by Chris Gethart. He is a pretty well-known comedian, and it is part of the Earwolf Network, and it has, as I mentioned, one of the most unique premises premise that you ever will hear in a podcast. So what happens is Chris will open up a phone line, and he will take one phone call for one hour, and there's no names involved. It's completely anonymous. And what he does is he will talk to this person about anything on their mind and this could be and it has come out in the first dozen episodes all kinds of different topics we've heard from people who really hate their job and they want to get out of it but they don't know how to change the course they're on people who are struggling with alcoholism people who've had all kinds of different issues it's not like a therapy show because as i mentioned chris is a comedian um he's been featured on uh this american life he's got his own show called the chris gethart show he was named one of timeout's 10 best comedians of 2015 uh he is a big deal uh in the comedy world coming out of new york uh northern new jersey area and 
And uh, these phone calls uh, can be so raw and so real. And, and Chris will, uh, you know, give them some levity and what they're talking about it. Um, but these people will confess things. You know, there'll be family secrets that'll be put out there. All kinds of different things that can happen. And uh, sometimes he'll play a game with them when they start mentioning things like location because he may be trying to figure out sort of where they are from. Um, and he tells them, you can talk as long as you want. You can hang up if you want to. In fact, the most recent episode at the time of the recording, episode 12, there was a hang up 38 minutes in uh, to the, the typical hour long call. Uh, but the episode I heard with the, the guy who literally wanted out of his job, hated his job, hated it most of his life. Just he had this guy sitting outside the building under a tree on a break and he had him just like he's telling him, it's like, just do one thing different. Just do one thing different. The guy wanted to do stand up was what he really wanted to do. And he had him yelling out loud when cars were driving by. See, you just did one unpredictable thing. And, you know, and he said, there's a show tonight. I just Googled it in your area. Area. It's an open mic night. Tell me you're going to that open mic night. You know, it just was a phenomenal, real conversation to listen to. And it's unique listening. You will not hear a show uh, anywhere else that's doing something like this. And it is just kind of that almost reality TV voyeuristic type listening. And it will just it's completely compelling. Uh, it's beautiful stories from anonymous people. And uh, Palmer, I understand you've not heard of this one before. I have not. How's it sound? It, it sounds amazing. I, I like the, I mean, people love voyeurism. I mean, and that's one of the reasons that people enjoy podcasts that are conversations because you're, you're basically sitting in a booth at a diner listening to the people behind you only it's better sound quality. Yeah, exactly. And, and boy, is that uh, quality ever pulled out in this type of conversation because it is sold as completely anonymous. And so the people call and Chris doesn't ask them their names. It's never brought up. Uh, and so people knowing that they are truly anonymous will pretty much share anything. And uh, that definitely comes through. Um, it's a really unique show, folks. And I, I, I couldn't throw my recommendation behind it any more than I do. It's a, it's a second or third Earwolf show. Third Earwolf show, I believe, I've recommended over the years. And I've not explored Earwolf enough. And I, every time I do, I hear something amazing. And uh, on the last recommendation show, believe it or not, I also recommended an Earwolf show, which was I Was There Too with Matt Gorley, which is another phenomenal show, still putting out great stuff. So uh, links to beautiful stories from anonymous people with the host Chris Gethart are in the show notes. Uh, Chris is on Twitter, of course, and that link will be there as well. That is show number one on this recommendations show. And Palmer, over to you for show number two. All right. I'm going to go with the West Wing Weekly. It is an episode by episode discussion of the West Wing, which has now been off air for too long, although obviously it had run its course. I think it had seven seasons. Um, the the show is hosted by, oh, I really hope I get this right, Rishi Kesherway and Josh Molina. Now, Rishi is, uh, does a podcast called Song Exploder. And Josh, you know, was on the show, obviously. And they um they they launched it not too long ago when West Wing finally came to Netflix and to me that sounds like perfect timing because while I do while I was a fan of the show and I do own all of the DVDs it's not necessary anymore and a lot of people have Netflix I would say most podcast listeners have Netflix so you can li uh, watch the show one by one they they put out one episode a week and they're going to my assumption is, based on what I've heard of the show, that they're going to go through all uh, seven seasons, which is – it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, th there's – obviously, they go through the episodes and discuss them, but they also have guests on from the show, and they also have guests on from behind the scenes of the show. So some of the um, the real-world uh, political consultants who had worked in, say – uh, a Clinton White House before they joined the staff of the West Wing writing team or consulting team will come on and talk about, you know, how the episode that they were talking about actually relates to real life. And there, there's this very interesting balance um, between 
you know, hearing someone tell a real story and then being like, but yeah, the characters on the show completely got it. Um, so it says a lot about the show, but the other thing is it's fun. It, you know, Josh having been on the show as Will Bailey, um, later on in the run, I think maybe around uh, season three or four and Rishi just being a fanatic. Um, it's a very interesting dynamic. They don't always see eye to eye, which is exactly what I want out of an episode by episode discussion podcast. Um, and it's really just if you liked the show or if you remember it, um, it might be worth getting into again. I know that people have um, – Josh was also in Sports Night, which was written by Aaron Sorkin. And I know people um, may or may not have enjoyed some of Sorkin's other writing, like the Facebook movie. Uh, the writing on the show is phenomenal. But these guys just – you know, they're, they're fans – first and foremost and they talk about it with love despite the fact that they may or may not agree and they may or may not like everything in every episode i'm looking at the website i seem to remember this now i never watched the show way back when but i understand it's coming back into somewhat prominence nowadays in our political environment if you will i've heard it referenced because what was it the the press uh the press secretary or the 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 public Yes. Vocal. Per- she came and did something for Obama like three weeks ago, four weeks ago at the time of recording. Right. She did the she did a little thing Ye- at the White House, I believe. Yeah. She jumped on to the uh, press secretary's. Uh, Allison. Janney, Allison right? Janney. Yep. She was C.J. Craig, the press secretary on the West Wing. Yes. And she uh, basically hijacked the uh, the podium from the standing um, from Obama's standing press secretary and, you know, kind of, kind of had a little fun with it. And then he came out and then she, I, I, you know what, I feel bad because I don't know what charity she was talking about, but she was raising awareness for something. Um, And this is the 24 hour news cycle. I can't remember. That was weeks ago. Um, (laughs) I was was barely remembering (laughs) the whole thing myself. So, but, but, you know, the, the idea that, um, you know, First of all, the one thing I love about the show is they dispel the myth that this was in response to the Republican Bush White House, because this show started in 1999 when Clinton was still in office. Um, Now, say what you want about the two parties. This was a well-written show. I think both sides of the aisle were were portrayed well on it. Um, But you know what? There are. I've I've heard some good and some bad episode by episode, um, you know, podcasts. And obviously, more often than not, they are of shows that are going on right now. But, you know, to be able to, at your leisure, go back and not have the Internet spoil anything, because I'm pretty sure nobody's going to, you know, as of this recording, they're up to episode eight or nine. And I'm pretty sure nobody's going to be like, in episode 10 um of the west wing this happened like you're safe like you can you can pretty well take this at your leisure um but it's it's very well done and they bring in you know they have modern discussions they compare and contrast it's it it's phenomenal as a fan of the show when it did air i have started re-watching the episodes so i'm familiar when the podcast episodes come out and i know what they're talking about and you're right. There are other ones out there doing this to, to varying different degrees of success. I remember, boy, I got hooked about a year and a half ago. Not long after I started the show, um, there is a uh, Seinfeld, I, Seincast, I believe it's called, was doing something similar episode by episode by episode. And uh, it was just excellent. And um, uh, they do a great job. And I believe there's one on the Golden Girls as well. And so uh, it's it's a unique approach to a show, especially like you say, if you kind of, it looks like these guys are releasing, let's see here, May 4th, May 11th, May 18th. So whatever day of the week that is, if you could get in the habit of like, you know, the night before, make that your regular weekly viewing of the episode that's, you know, going to be released the next day, you could kind of kind of fall into a real nice kind of, you know, routine of, you know, viewing then listening, uh, you know, the talk about it would be pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. You can uh, – the the show is at West Wing Weekly and uh, it's – the website you were referring to is thewestwingweekly.com. 
And those links will be in the show notes as well, folks. That's our second show recommendation, the West Wing Weekly, which is not easy to say from a tongue twister standpoint from from Palmer. And uh, that uh, slides the uh, the uh, the uh, stick, the talking stick back to me for my second show recommendation. Again, kind of uh, harping on my initial statement on uh, uniqueness. I've got another one that I think is one of those boy. I, you know, why didn't I think of this? Because this, honestly, even if I had, I couldn't do it as good as what this guy's doing. The host name is Jason Weiser. The show is called Myths and Legends, and it has been doing extraordinarily well lately. Uh, I've noticed it all up in the high zones on the iTunes charts, and uh, deservedly so. Uh, and I do want to give credit, actually, to friend of the show, Mike Boudet from Sword and Scale, which, by the way, is also taking off uh, in insanely well. Uh, he pointed this show out to me and said dude you've got to check this show out what he's doing is phenomenal and sure enough uh you know if if mike from sword and scale tells me something's great i I know it's got to be great because you know the work mike does so i go over and check out myths and legends and i have just been blown away so what this uh what jason's doing with this show is he takes folklore um and old tales if you will and really turns them into something that is uh, contemporary and consumable today. So he takes stories from, you know, the, the 1800s or even the Greek mythology or or old, old tales mostly. Uh, some of them are famous stories, some of them not so much. Uh, and uh, he will take this old material and he will write scripts that make it super approachable. Uh, and I mean, really like a, a modern conversation with a friend and and it makes it completely consumable uh and ends up shining a light on stories that i think well did i hear about that when i was a kid and you know stories of thor and the the brothers grim and you know old dragon stuff and just really unique old time stories of of uh lore and myths and uh it, it it's it's amazing what he does i'll tell you what I have featured uh, and interviewed a lot of great podcast hosts and producers, and some of their production values are sky high. I will, I will make this statement. I will take Jason Weiser and Myths and Legends and place him right up on that top shelf in terms of production value. He literally does, from the moment the episode starts through the conclusion, and that includes an intro, sort of a preview of what's coming up, ad breaks, and a conclusion in a segment at the end, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it literally sounds like you ever see those movies or those scenes and you're like, wow, was that one take? That's the feeling you get when you listen to this. Now, I'm sure he edits, but it is done exquisitely. Uh, And it literally feels as if he's just taking you all the way through this story. Like, I, what makes it beautiful is I, I know there's ads, but you don't even really they don't even they're just so intertwined so well uh and he kind of transitions from you know each segment and ad break and the conclusion that is uh you just have to hear it it's got musical beds uh behind different segments that are so appropriate he links up to all his music in the show notes website and artwork that will blow your mind uh it's mythpodcast.com that website of course in the show notes uh, and new artwork for each and every episode that just, you know, kind of fits into that sort of something maybe you'd see on the cover of a, you know, book in the library about that about that legend or that myth or that old tale. And it's just the full package. He's got, you know, a, a member, uh, a membership kind of means where you can get extra stuff to help support the show and it's just the total package uh from production to writing to narration i mean i've heard some great narrators Uh, i've interviewed a lot of great narrators jason is right up there with the work that he does in the show and i know i'm getting a little bit fanboyish on this thing right here but i hope my enthusiasm is coming through because if what i'm describing even appeals to to any of you listening and even the slightest bit check this show out because the writing is brilliant um the narration is top notch uh and 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 jason will even break that fourth wall uh here and there and sort of give his own commentary on things um and then kind of hop back to the story which again kind of does that you know, personal connection we were talking about, Palmer, where you kind of get to know Jason a little bit as well through the process. 
Um, amazing show, uh, and, and couldn't come with a higher recommendation from me. And I understand, Palmer, there's another one you haven't heard of. No, but the way you uh, fanboy about it, if you will, <laughs> uh, makes me think that um, you know anyone who's interested in this should probably check out his podcast before going to Audible to hear something else. I mean, it, you know, it, not, not to go too tangent, but you know, with a podcast like that, um, let's say your fanboy was, you know, 50% of the positive. It still sounds so much better than some of the stuff that's, you know, an audio book, so to speak. Yeah. So, Oh, and, and uh, yeah, I think this is better than an audio book. Yeah. So by all means, uh, I, I will, you know, check it out when I get the time. Oh, yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm on the website now. I mean, here's just a couple of the episode titles. Um, Alibaba, uh, Viking saga, Latin American folklore. There's grim Prometheus, King Arthur stories. Um, Irish legends, um, Japanese fairy tales, uh, Thor. He's done a couple shows on Thor, I believe. Um, you know, Icarus and Daedalus, portraits of a, a portrait of the artificer as a young man, um, Russian fairy tales, Slavic folklore, just stuff you've probably never heard of, and it's so interesting. Oh, I mentioned earlier about the the segment at the end, which is super cool. He usually just throws this like two to three minute segment at the end. He calls Creature of the Week, where he just picks some creature that tends to appear uh, in, in myths and legends and lore and just kind of tells you what it is. Like, this is what it is. This is where it's from. This is where it originated in, 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 in lore. And so next time, you know, if you start to get into this stuff, you realize, oh, I remember that creature type situation. I'm telling you, this was not material that I was previously would have considered myself into until I heard this show. But wow, it's, it's so, so good. Uh, so that's myths and legends. That is my second show recommendation. Third overall on the show. That means there is one more remaining talking stick passed back to you, Palmer. All right. The, the, the fourth and final recommendation is going to be for the internet history podcast. Now, for those of you who, uh, let's say, are of a certain age, there was a sound we associated with the Internet. It was called a dial-up modem. And uh, interestingly enough, the theme song for the uh, Internet History Podcast in incorporates that into a bit of um, music. But it is, you know, it was started by Brian McCullough or hosted by Brian McCullough. He started it in 2014, which was – um, as he put it, uh, the anniversary of the internet era as we know it. Um, he started, he, you know, he came to 1994 because it was when Netscape was founded and it was when the Netscape IPO kind of blew up and the whole Silicon Valley kind of started from there. Um, it's, it's a show where he does chapters and he will sit down with something that he has researched very well. And, you know, he will give you the story of Netscape, um, you know, say from where the Mosaic browser that predated it through Netscape. And then he'll do supplemental chapters where I think at the moment or, you know, he's up to like a, uh, he's well over 100 episodes. He's well past. Um, this is one of the shows I'm actually still working through the archive on. Um, but he's got. Uh, supplemental episodes where he interviews the people he talks about in the chapters. Um, and, you know, it's, it's phenomenal for anyone who wants to know how we got here. It is a, you know, a look into the past, but you, you see patterns uh, emerge, which is also fantastic. Um, he calls it uh, an interactive project he interacts with people who want to, uh, you know, give, you know, help with research or whatnot. Um, you know, everything, you know, it's, it's an open dialogue, but it is fantastic. And it was something that before I stumbled onto this podcast, I was reading up all I could about say Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, you know, the history and origins of the internet, you know, because, you know, it, I came to realize that not only are my hobbies online, but my day job is online. And, and, and right now, if the internet were to go away, I would be out of a job and many hobbies. And I wanted to know more about this thing that sustains, uh, me, 
um, both, you know, financially and, um, you know, from, um, you know, a fun standpoint. And this, this podcast does an amazing job. Like I said, I started at the very beginning. Um, I'm, I'm only at episode 32. There are, um, oh, well over a hundred right now, but it is, you know, I'm, I'm not always going to be the guy who says you have to go through the archive, but, uh, I will caveat the internet history podcast with the fact that it is a linear story and it builds upon itself. So you learn about, you know, from the, the archive that I've been through, you learn about um, Mosaic and you learn about Netscape and then you learn about how Internet Explorer came into that mix and where AOL came from and, you know, the origins of Yahoo. You know, all of these things build up. And I'm sure by the time I actually get up to date, all of those things will build up and there are obvious callbacks. Um, you can't have a conversation about the Internet as we know it without someone of a certain age going back like I remember Netscape and Mosaic and I remember when I was all text and you know then we got images and they took 30 minutes to load and they were only about an inch by an inch on your screen and they were blurry and pixelated we we came from somewhere and it's a fantastic and amazing story for how we got there yeah, this is something I need to be all over. <laughs> I have a long uh, documented uh, love of technology, and I have seen this one come across my stream at some point, uh, and I don't know why. Probably, as you mentioned, time. Uh, I just not yet jumped in, but wow, does this ever look interesting to me. Yeah, and you know what? I'll tell you, the, at, at the moment, and I, I have to say at the moment because I've only listened, I'm, I'm, you know, not through the archive by any stretch. I'm a third of the way. He had the marketing mind behind the AOL discs on for an interview. Right. And not to give too much away because there was a lot in there, but she actually talked about how they gave AOL floppy disks, not CDs, floppy disks, away with Omaha Steaks. But before they could do that, they had to flash freeze a floppy disk and then thaw it out to make sure it still worked. Now, this was this was successful, but just as a small one more tangent, I would love to go back to floppy disks for the sheer fact that you could flash freeze it and it would still work. You could drop it. You could do a lot of things to a floppy disk. You you would have to rip it apart in order for it not to work. Think about the technology you're listening to us on now. What happens if you flash freeze it? I'm pretty sure it won't work when it thaws out. And this is where we came from. And it, oh, it, it, you know, I, I grew up with the internet, the same as you, Dan. And I, I remember the days of, um, telling my friends, like, oh, you know, I was, you know, kind of, I found this little game on the internet and, um, not to, put myself into too much of the geek nerd category, but they were all like, Oh, well, have you seen AOL? And I was like, that's not the internet. Um, <laughs> not exactly. The same. Yeah. Uh, and he does go into the fact that, you know, AOL prodigy, they were walled gardens and then there was the actual internet and they aren't one in the same, but for anyone who even remotely is curious or interested as to how we got here, whether you're a technophile or not, give it a shot and jump in on, you know, I, I, I know I'm sure there are people that just listen to the chapter episodes for the, for the history. I'm sure there are people that skip them and just listen to the supplemental inner, you know, interviews. I listen to it all. I I'm absolutely in love with it. Uh, as a technophile, as a history guy, like I, I can't say enough good things about the internet history podcast. InternetHistoryPodcast.com is the website uh, at Twitter at NetHistoryPod, and I'm looking at it right now, and there's the host, Brian McCullough. And what's funny is I was kind of getting together all my links for the show notes and everything as you were talking there, Palmer. And if you guys want just one last testimonial to what apparently, you know, the, the credence of, of uh, this host in this show, 
Uh, I went and clicked through Brian McCullough on Twitter. He is uh, a 2016 TED resident. And if you don't know what that is, TED Talks, everybody's heard of TED Talks. I just went over and looked at it. TED Residency. Listen to this. The TED Residency program is an incubator for breakthrough ideas, free and open to all uh, via a semi-annual competitive application. Those chosen as TED residents will spend four months at TED headquarters in New York working on their ideas. Although some may produce an artwork, a manuscript, or an amazing theorem each resident will also develop a ted talk and deliver it on a ted stage that's the host of this show if that gives you any kind of idea of of what you're in for if you go and check out agent palmer's recommendation so those are our four shows palmer we did it wow it's fantastic we made it through all the way to the end uh what are your final thoughts on your podcast digest experience at long end i I, I, you know what? It lived up to the hype, Dan. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm extremely thankful uh, that we were able to make this uh, covert action declassified so that we could share it go. with the masses. Well, I couldn't have asked for a better co-host on episode 94 for another recommendation show. Folks, one more time, check out agentpalmer.com, all the great work that Palmer described, and, uh, and follow Palmer on Twitter and talk to him because he will talk back to you. I promise you. Okay, let him know you like the blog posts or you like his work on all the various shows. And even better yet, tell him about some of the great podcasts you're listening to uh, because he's always looking for new stuff, right? I am always looking for new stuff. Palmer, thanks for taking the time to join me, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Dan. Folks, that'll do it for episode 94 of the Podcast Digest. That is our recommendation episode. I'll be back again next week with another great interview and another show to add to your subscription list. That I can promise you. Until then, my name is Dan Lizette, and I will talk to you then. Thank you for listening to the Podcast Digest. You can follow the show on Twitter at PodDigest. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the podcast digest. Email the show feedback at the podcast digest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info.